Oh, okay, I think we are online. So welcome everybody uh, to the final lecture today of our online workshop on next generation quantum clocks. Um, the speaker of this lecture is uh, Thorsten Schum from uh, University of, uh, of Vienna. He is a uh, um, professor leading a group in, uh, in experimental quantum optics and uh, also director uh, of the Atom Institute of the University in Vienna, which is a research reactor. Uh, so he is uh, conveniently positioned between atomic physics, quantum physics, and uh, nuclear physics, uh, which uh, is the ideal background for the subject of, uh, of his talk. He will speak about the uh, thorium uh, nuclear clock as one of the yeah, interesting systems for the next generation quantum clock. Thorsten, please, the floor is yours. Or oh, maybe I should uh, say one more word to the to the audience. Uh, uh, please, uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to ask questions. You may do after the talk, of course, via uh, here in the forum. And also there is the opportunity to ask, to type in questions already uh, in these Q and A, or in my version, it's it's probably German F and A. You may also you may either type your question in there during the talk, or you may ask, um, uh, of course, uh, at the end of the talk. So with this, please, Thorsten, go ahead with your lecture. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, well, maybe two corrections. We are not University of Vienna. We are University of we are. We are a university of technology. So there's two universities in Vienna, and we are the Vienna University of Technology. Um, so this is maybe more about the over next generation um, of clocks. So this is all very far future, um, but I hope you will enjoy it anyways. I will tell you a little bit about um, the status of our efforts to build uh, maybe uh, a thorium clock um, one day. Great, so I will, for those of you um, who, who haven't heard about this, um, most of you will probably have, but uh, for those of you who haven't, I will quickly over, go over the general motivation. Why should one use a nucleus to build a clock and how, how, can, you, how can you use a nucleus at all um, to, to, for, for laser manipulation? And this is, as, as uh, Eckhart pointed out, linked to a very specific, very rare isotope, which is called thorium 229. Um, and then um, I would tell you about three recent experiments uh, that have been performed uh, that significantly increased our knowledge and understanding of what's going on with this thorium nucleus. Um, most probably I won't have the time to go through all of them and I guess it's a better idea to explain um, just one well instead of rushing through three and then you don't get anything. Um, so, uh, so this is this this talk was called new results on thorium, and it's actually really quite new. So this field is developing well. So there's a lot of new information coming in. So you see, there's two publications. The lower two uh, topics were covered by publications uh, which came out in September last year, and the stuff that I'm going to talk about today actually uh, came out uh, last week uh, in, in in this PRL publication. Uh, so do you actually see my mouse? Can anybody confirm if you see my mouse moving over the screen? Yes, we do. Okay, great, great. So that's like a little slide. Good. So, uh, um, so yeah, I wanted to point out that this is supposed to be interactive. So if you have questions or something is unclear, please make yourself known immediately um, and, and interrupt me. And then I can try to explain it another way or, or answer a specific question or go into more details um, if there's interest in specific um, areas. Okay, so please ask questions um, if you have any. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Let's start at this weird idea of uh, combining nuclear physics and quantum physics and laser spectroscopy and atomic clock. All right, so I can quickly go over this because you are a crowd that is very well familiar, familiar with atomic physics and the beauty of discrete energy levels. So the electron shell provides discrete energy levels and scanning those we allows us to learn about atomic physics and maybe we can use this discreteness and if these transitions are narrow, we can use them to build uh, fantastic measurement devices among which are atomic clocks. If you zoom in on the, the atomic nucleus, 
you you grow you blow this up by four orders of magnitude you find that also the nucleus is a quantum object uh, it also has discrete bound state uh, and to some extent there is a similarity but there is a big a big difference which is this capital m here which indicates that the involved energy scales in the atomic nucleus are many orders of magnitude five to six orders of magnitudes larger so in order to play with this level structure here you need very, very, very high energies. And this is why usually nuclear physics is somewhere in the high energy physics department, atomic physics is in the low energy physics department. Usually they're in separate buildings and they prefer not to speak to each other too much. Um, and so a few years ago, actually Eckhart came up with the idea, um, well, he, can't, he didn't come up with the idea, but he made it popular for the Thorium system. Why not try to transfer some of these exquisite tools that we have on the atomic physics side to probe nuclear physics systems? And I just told you that that's impossible because there's this M here and we need these high energies. But there are a few exotic nuclei which have low energetic uh, nuclear levels. And maybe there's a chance to play with those ones. And this brings us to the thorium, because thorium, among all of these exotic nuclei, thorium-229, as far as we know today, is the one that has the lowest excited nuclear state. So above the nuclear ground state, we expect to, to have a, a nuclear excited state just above the, the ground state, with a distance of about eight electron volts above the ground state, which is really like a joke for nuclear physics energies. So this is a tiny, tiny, we, we call this, nuclear physicists call this degenerates, right? So in atomic physics, ATV is far from degenerate. In nuclear physics, this is our degenerate nuclear level. And this corresponds to an excitation wavelength of about 150 nanometers. Um, how much and how many digits of this 150 nanometers we know will be subject of, my, of, of today's talk, okay? So, so that one, and as far as we know, only that one may be within reach for laser manipulation if we manage to build a narrow 150 nanometer laser, which is uh, complicated on itself. Okay, and so this is thorium-229. As I said, we can, to first approximation, we can do this as, we can see this as a two-level system, as the ground state, this is the excited state, it's separated by about eight electron volts. And um, the interesting thing, we call this the isomer state. Uh, the interesting thing about this two-level system is that it ex it's extremely long lived We don't know exactly how long, but it's minutes to hours, okay? So this excited state, once we manage to populate it, uh, stays there for minutes to hours. And that is uh, that makes a very, very narrow line width. And in this community, narrow line width is something that people uh, dearly desire. Good. So thorium-229, um, uh, why is it uh, not so easy to play with that? And why did Eckhart mention the fact that I, uh, I'm, I'm in this building here and you see this little box up at the, at the top left here. This one hosts a little nuclear reactor. Well, this is due to the fact that thorium-229 is actually a so-called radioisotope. So it's an unstable isotope. It has a lifetime of about 8,000 years. Um, and because it has a comparatively short lifetime, it means that if it had been produced in the Big Bang, um, it's decayed ever since, and so there's nothing left. So that means that all the thorium-229 we have on this planet currently is entirely man-made. These are essentially leftovers uh, from the Manhattan Project and uh, related activities uh, during the Cold War. In the Cold War, large amounts of uranium-233 were produced in uh, high-flux neutron reactors, and these, uh, these decay through alpha decay into thorium-229, and this is the global stock we have. Uh, it's not quite clear how much we have, but it's really not a mass. It's, it's really a few, a few milligrams, maybe a few hundred milligrams. Um, but extracting this from the other material is, is very cumbersome. So it's very rare, it's hard to get by. Um, one thing that you should take into account is that if, if that two level system here has an excitation energy of eight electron volts, this is in the ballpark of binding electronic binding energies, okay? So that means that if you want to manipulate the nucleus, you have to make sure that you don't have electronic states um, nearby, and in particular, if you start with a neutral thorium atom, 
you will, you will actually rip off the outermost electron if you start shining this electron at this atom. So the ionization energies are written down here. And to be free of electronic available states, you need to ionize your thorium. So you need to work with an ion. There are various ways to do that. Ion traps is a very, very straightforward and popular one. This two-level system is a so-called M1 magnetic transition. So it weakly interacts with electromagnetic radiation. And as I already turned, uh, pointed out, it's not easy to find an excitation source around 150 nanometers. We call this VUV. This is vacuum ultraviolet because this wavelength doesn't travel in air. So everything has to be done in vacuum. And that makes things a little bit complicated. But there are a few pros to use this two-level system um, for quantum physics and maybe a clock. Uh, first of all is that it is extremely stable because it's a nuclear transition. It has small nuclear moments and it weakly interacts with external perturbating fields like magnetic or electric. So there's, there's orders of magnitudes, uh, smaller black body shift, um, and it's, it's very robust. It's so robust that we can do really nasty stuff with it. And the most nasty stuff that I can think of is solid state physics. And so in, our, in my group, we actually put this nuclear two level system in a, in a solid environment in a chemical bond that heats up the outer electrons. And we, we proceed the idea of producing a solid state nuclear clock, which wouldn't even need a vacuum system apart from that the light needs to reach it. There's another factor in fundamental physics why this is an interesting transition, and I will tell you a little bit more about this in a minute, which is a very high sensitivity of this nuclear two-level system to variations um, of fundamental interactions, and in particular, the fine structure constant. All right, so uh, this, is, this is ridiculous that I'm showing you this because you've probably seen slides like this uh, many, many times during the last uh, hours and days. This is just to remind you that um, whatever you use to quantify a clock performance, it will to some extent involve the Q factor, which is the absolute transition frequency over the line width. And as I just told you, the absolute transition frequency is high. It's still low for nuclear physics, but for atomic physics, it's very high. So this number will be quite, oh, there's my mouse here. This number will be quite, quite large. And as I said, the lifetime is minutes to hours. This number here will be quite small. So in general, this is a good clock transition because it will have a, a high quality factor. And as I just said, um, there are ways to actually build this in a solid state environment. Solid state usually means 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 particles um, or even more compared to ion traps where you have a uh, single or few ions, maybe up to 10 to the five. But there's 10 orders of magnitudes to be gained in interrogated uh, oscillators. If you go to solid state, and there might be another benefit um, for, for, a, for a nuclear clock by using many, many, many ions. All right, uh, just one word again on this uh, variation to fundamental constants. In 2006, Victor Flumbaum um, wrote a very influential paper where he discovered that this 8 EV electra, um, nuclear transition between the nuclear ground state and the first nuclear excited state, which we call the isomeric state, this one here is very, very sensitive to variation of fundamental constants. And that is related to the fact that these two energies, where's my mouse here, these two energies are essentially two degenerate um, binding energies of the nucleus where the binding energies are huge because of the strong forces that play a role in the nucleus. Uh, the binding energies are huge, um, but they are almost the same. And so that means that if these huge binding energies are changing a little bit, um, but we are looking at something that is extremely close together, um, we, we are sensitive uh, we, are, we are highly sensitive to variation of energy scales that contribute to these binding energies. Um, so if, that, if these contributing energies or const, uh, interaction constants would change a, lot, a tiny little bit, this energy here would drift apart. And there's a vivid discussion on how strongly this drifting apart um, is, uh, is, is enhanced compared to electronic transitions, if it's three orders or four orders or five orders of magnitude, that depends on um, how strong the contribution of the various fundamental interactions in the nuclei are, in the nucleus are uh, with respect to these binding energies. 
And this is not quite clear yet, but we all uh, we are all very positive that there will be a significant enhancement factor by many orders of magnitude compared to uh, electronic transitions. Uh, and this is, is this is, and people really shout at each other over this topic on conferences, and it's very very vivid. And so, just this summer there was another paper uh, coming out making another prediction for uh, for this for this sensitivity, which looks very optimistic. So, so that should allow us by by building a clock. It's not so much the clock that motivates us, but it's the possibility to precisely monitor this energy gap. And if this energy gap shows uh, variations in time or space, that may be a sensitive indicator for variations of fundamental constants. And if we turn this argument around, um, so if we if we take into account this enhancement factor then it means that we actually don't have to build a very, very good clock. We can build a comparatively lousy clock and still be compatible um, in, with other experiments that uh, are looking for variations in fundamental constants. All right, good. So that was part of the, in well, not part, that was the introduction. And uh, maybe it's a good moment to think about um, what I just said and, and ask a question. I won't continue until somebody asks a question. Really? No? I don't see the chat from here. So if anybody sees questions in the chat, please tell me um, because I can't see it in this full screen version. Here. Yes, I will tell you, but uh, at present there is no hands up. All right, then I will go on. Good. Okay. So um, I, I told you that the transition energy, I, I was a bit vague on this. I said it's about 8 EV and it's about 150 nanometers. Um, and I spoke about the Q factor. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that the, the, the defining Q factor, which is the transition frequency and the line width, we have essentially no idea on both of these quantities. So the, neither the transition frequency or the excitation energy of the nucleus is very well known. It gets known better and better almost by the day, but it's still known to percent level, which obviously is, is ridiculous for building a clock. And the line width is also not known by, not even to the order of magnitude, okay? So, um, but what, what I will, will be telling you now is efforts to pin down, in particular, the energy uh, of the nuclear excitation um, and a little bit of history on, on, on what happened. All right, good. So here again, so now, so now this is nuclear physics, okay? That means that numbers you see, you have to, you have to take into account that these are high energy numbers. So these, these numbers here, these are kilo electron volts. This is the nuclear level structure of thorium-229. And you see down here, so this is 29 keV. This is the second excited state. Um, and this is the first excited state. And the, in the, in the nuclear charge, they don't even put a number here because it's so ridiculously slow, uh, low, low for them that they, they don't dare to, to, to write anything here. So, but this is the one we, we want, okay? And now the, the, the question is, how do we learn something um, about this energy? Well, we, we learn something about this energy in a similar way than we learn about this, this, this entire uh, level diagram, which is we look at, at nuclear decay. So if we take uranium-233, this spontaneously alpha decays into the excited states of the thorium-229 nucleus. There is a certain probability to, be, to decay to the ground state. That is, in this case, actually quite high, it's 84%. But, uh, but the remaining percentages, they all fall into these excited states. And then they cascade down, usually very, very quickly, so they cascade down by sending out photons. So this is, uh, these photons are gammas because they are high energy and they are come from the nucleus. But apart from that, it's essentially like nuclear fluorescence. Okay, and we put this on a gamma detector, on a gamma spectrometer, and measure these energies very precisely. And so th this is how we learn about nuclear level structures. Usually we do this through gamma spectroscopy. Um, and now the interesting thing is if you look at where these flashes end, there's obviously also transition rules between these nuclear levels. There's a conservation of angular momentum and so on. 
So their, their decay path, which leads, some of them lead to the ground state. You see this one goes to the ground state and some of them lead to the excited state, okay? So now it is actually quite straightforward to find transition path um, and, and measure these precisely and then you sum up and you differentiate some of them and you actually can get to this, to this sequence here, okay? And that, that sounds easy. The problem is that uh, to, I, I already told you, this is about 8 EV. You, you need to be able to measure energies on the 100 keV scale with EV resolution. And this is extremely hard. And this is what's been done for almost or close to 40 years now, okay? So um, this, is, this is how we obtained knowledge over, over decades, essentially. Um, about the, the energy here and the prediction that this, this energy here is actually in the range of laser excitation. Uh, this one um, comes from the year 6076, um, where a publication predicted that they, they couldn't obviously directly resolve this here, but by, by, by putting these arrows and seeing where, where they ended up, um, they, they, could, they could conjecture that this splitting here is below 100 EV, which was already spectacularly low um, in, in that time scale. So this is essentially the year that I was born. And then over the years, these experiments have been repeated over and over again, and depending or reanalyzed again, including new lines and new knowledge about the, the, the nuclear structure. Um, there, were, there were predictions on the energy of the, on the excitation energy of the nuclear excited state. Um, and then there was a turning point around 2007, uh, 2007 um, when a group um, focused on the lowest energy states. You see here is a zoom of the lowest energy states. This is the isomer state. Um, at that time, one believed it would be 165 nanometers. You see this is still changing over time quite dramatically. This is the second excited state at 29 keV. And this group, um, they, this, is, this is a PRL and published in 2007, uh, focused on the decay path that goes from the 71 kV level, either two steps down or one step over and then down, okay? And if you measure these four lines here, you see them, these are the four lines in the gamma spectrometer. If you measure them with uh, sufficient prediction, uh, with sufficient resolution, um, you can just take these minus these, and then you come up uh, with the energy, and this one um, was was uh, the result of this measurement was 7.8 plus minus a half electron volts. Okay, this this is uh, this corresponds to plus minus 10 or 12 nanometers, so it's an incredibly large area from a laser spectroscopy perspective. But still, it's it, it was the best and most most accepted measurement uh, done in 2007, and then reanalyzed for some subtleties of the decay path. Um, over over the years, but that was a very important result because it shifted the the predicted excitation energy uh, away from the optical. You see, these are all optical energies into the vacuum ultraviolet, and that made um, things a bit complicated. But also explain why many many of the attempts to directly excite this this energy or observe a, a photon coming out here uh, did fail. Okay. So, so that was that was the measurement in 2007, and it has it has many shortcomings. And from today's perspective, uh, it's an almost naive publication. It's it's it's, uh, it's it's cute how 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 many things were were essentially neglected or had to be fed in later. Um, so so some of the aspects, for example, that the, these lines here, um, you you see in in this graph here, you see there's there's additional tra transitions that have to be taken into account, which are weak. Um, and, and couldn't be resolved, but these two states, these two lines here, they're actually doublets. Uh, this one has incredibly low statistics. And, and so, yeah, we, we, we thought one, one should be able to do this better. Um, um, that was kind of naive, and it took us seven years um, until last week <laughs> to actually do this experiment a little better. But it was really a very, very important um, uh, measurement. And the value that was published in 2007 or 2009, there was a little shift in 2009, um, and lasted on for the entire community for, for, for many years. OK, so the, the important thing that we, what we learned from this experiment is essentially that the, the transition is now in the vacuum ultraviolet. And uh, you have to take into account that many of the previous attempts or, or 
or manipulation attempts of the thorium isomer were done either in air or even in water um, because it's, it's a chemical you have to do with this thorium is, is, is nothing you can you can just buy in a pharmacy um, and so it, it's uh, if, if, if that was true and we have uh, many reasons to believe that it's really in the vacuum ultraviolet um, then it's obvious why many of these attempts have failed okay um, also, if you go, if, if I go back one step, these energies here, they are all below the ionization energy of the neutral thorium, okay? Now, if you go to 7.8 or even a little bit higher, um, then you will see that this is above the ionization energy. So that means that if you start playing with a neutral thorium, um, then you will highly, you will with a very, 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 very high efficiency um, ionize the thorium with your vacuum ultraviolet laser source instead of exciting the nucleus. And that, that, that leads to the conclusion that if you want to manipulate the nucleus at this high energy, you have to make sure you control the electronic environment of your nucleus very, very well. And this can be done by putting it in a very known um, ionization stage into an ion trap or into a chemical bond, um, but that, that is something that we have to control um, very well. And what, one thing is clear, this, this here, all of this is, is nice, but actually there's, there's no proof of, of, of existence that this, this level here actually really exists. As long as you don't resolve um, a splitting in a line that either goes to the ground state or the isomer state, if you don't resolve these splittings here, um, then it, it, it may as well be that this state actually doesn't exist. And there are publications of people that become frustrated and skeptical and claim that maybe this state maybe doesn't exist. Okay, so that still remains to be proven. And that is one of the three results that I would tell you about if I had infinite time. Okay. So um, that's the situation in 2007, and we thought like, okay, we, we, we should be able to build a better detector and a dedicated detector. The detector that was used here is actually was a, a NASA um, device that was not at all intended to do this experiment. So it was um, not extremely well suited. It was the best gamma spectrometer at the time, uh, but um, it was built specifically for this experiment, and we thought we could do better, and we could, but it took much, much longer than we thought. Okay, but let's let's build a better detector. So this is what we did. Um, um, we, we started building a detector and what we did is we built a microcalorimeter. We, in that case, is in particular the group in Heidelberg of uh, Christian and Andreas Fleischmann. They are experts in building so-called magnetic microcalorimeters. And it's a really cool thing because it's, it's essentially a metal that absorbs uh, a photon and then this photon heats up this metal, and then this device is built to read out the heat change. So it's essentially a bolometer or a, it's a calorie meter, okay? And the way it works is that below this absorber plate, there is a paramagnetic uh, material. And when that changes temperature, it changes magnetization. And this change in magnetization is then read out by uh, a squid detector. And so uh, this turns into the magnetic, the magnetic property changes or it translates the, the heat change into an electric signal. And this, this is a, a very, very nice way to measure um, high energies. Of course, this needs to be extremely well controlled and shielded. So all of this is built into a cryostat, um, which is at a few hundred millikelvin. Um, the, the, the count rate of these things, because it's thermal, this thing can absorb one to 10 photons per second. So that means the measurements I'm going to show you were taken over a month, almost a year of continuous data taking with interruptions, of course, but it's incredibly slow. Um, to, to speed it up a little bit, you see that this is actually an array of detectors. So it's a pixel field to some extent, it's a, it's a gamma camera. Um, and it's a really nice, uh, really nice device. And the main thing is the resolution is about 10 EV, okay? Um, and that is very important. Okay, and then we essentially hold a uranium-233 sample. It's, a, it's actually a liquid, so it's uranium dissolved in some, some sort of liquid put in a container. 
and then it's in a bucket in front of the detectors. Um, and we measure the gamma lines that come out. Um, and we also put an americium source for, for calibration purposes to filter out small temperature groups for that technicality. Okay, so you see these, there, there are all these lines. Uh, these are X-ray lines, and then there is a variety of, of lines which can be associated um, to thorium-229. Um, so this this particular measurement uh, was was taken over eight weeks, and you see it's really quite a nice um, a nice uh, noise free measurement. Um, th these measurements are actually the data is all published online. If you go to the Zenodo uh, repository, you can actually download uh, this this spectrum and do your own analysis. And I see that somebody has raised a hand. I see that at the, the corner of my screen. Whoever raised the hand, please I ask the question. Uh, I should try to open the microphone. One minute, please. Mm. I can do it. Please, yeah. Ah. Somebody said no, sorry. No, I was searching. Uh, also, Hervé needed to activate his audio. Ah, okay. So, should I go on or should we wait for the question? Chairman. So, in Avi, you would you like to speak? No, sorry. Okay, please go ahead, Tosin. <laughs> okay, I go ahead. Good. Okay, so so these are these are the lines, and these correspond to the excited states um, of of the thorium nucleus. And now, aha. Okay, so now the the, the complicated task was um, to actually calibrate. So this this line here is conveniently already expressed in energy uh, but there's actually a whole lot of work in putting this line here because um, this detector obviously uh, reads out an electric signal and we have to transfer this electric signal to energy and we need an energy calibration and one would think like okay you just look up a few reference lines and then that is done the problem is that this detector is better than any other detector before so that means there's a large error on all of the reference lines and so the current limitation to this measurement is the energy calibration, um, which is due to the error of the reference lines that are registered. So we, if, if, and, and that's bad news and good news because, and this is why we put this thing online, that if people measure these reference lines with higher accuracy um, later on, we can actually improve the energy calibration and reduce the error on the, the measurements that I was just showing. Okay, so we go to the literature um, and try to find all of these lines as well as possible. Um, and we, 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 we try to stick to the gamma lines because the X-ray lines, sometimes they, they, they have additional effects due to, to the chemistry because they come from the electron shell. So we try to concentrate on the gammas. Um, and so we, we do an energy calibration. Okay, and here is here how it looks like. So if you, if you look at the so this is the voltage amplitude and if you if you look at where these lines lie you see like oh my god this is a really linear detector awesome but, but then you just do a linear correction you see like oh okay great there's a curve there's a quadratic term uh, but also this is really nicely quadratic so so this this is the good thing about this uh, this, this this detector is that it gained characteristics over this entire energy range here are, are quite smooth and quite well understood. So we can go to the third order in, in, in fitting, these, uh, fitting these reference lines, but still because of the uncertainty in the calibration lines, there's a residual energy calibration error, which is 0.7 EV. Okay, so that means that um, the, the, the lines that we measure here, their absolute position um, is fluctuating or is unsecure by 0.7 EV. Okay, but luckily, 
um, that doesn't matter too much because there is, um, as already was found in the 2007 publication by Beck, there is a clever way of using decay path. I showed you that the, the 2007 paper concentrated on these low energy, um, low energy gamma lines. And the reason is the following. There are two gamma lines, this one here and this one here. They are very close to each other. And this one here and this one here, they're also very close to each other. And as it turns out, um, you can directly infer the isomer energy, which is the, the energy gap between those two levels here, by, uh, by subtracting the difference between this 229 doublet and this 42 doublet, okay? And that is great because then the absolute calibration error almost drops out entirely because you're only measuring energy differences of very close by lines, okay? So you see these are the 229 keV lines and these are the 242 keV lines and this is the energy difference um, that, that we measure. And because, as I said, because the overall, because we measure very close by energies, the overall calibration error almost entirely drops out and we can reduce the error to uh, 0.17 electron volts. Okay, so this is the since one week, this is the, the published value um, of the isomer energy is 18.1 plus minus 0.17 electron volts. And this uh, this uh, this measurement um, also managed to uh, measure some of these uh, of these branching ratios that that these cross uh, transitions here. Um, that, that weren't measured before. So that is also very helpful. And these values here, they also allow us to reanalyze um, former data that has been taken, for example, in 2007 um, and so on. Okay. And so um, I, uh, going back to, to, to this spectrum or maybe even, maybe, maybe even here, so obviously there's not only these four lines, there are other decay paths you can find in order to uh, to extract this energy, we actually found oops sorry we actually found four different methods to extract this energy gap by looking at triangles here. So you can also use this these two and then these three on this side and so on. We found four different ways to extract the the isomer energy from this spectrum. There's probably more. You're free to find them, um, uh, but the um, several of them suffer from the fact that the absolute calibration error um, kicks in. That means that if you don't have this nice, uh, this nice kind of noise rejection by looking at nearby lines that you have in, in this scheme here, uh, the error increases. And here are the four results. These are the four results for the isomer energy that we extracted from this data. Um, you see some of them have a large error bar. This is the 2007 measurement, and this green line here is another measurement that was published in September last year uh, by the LMU group, which predicted a slightly higher value of seven point, uh, of 8.2 um, electron volts. But it's, it's, it's quite obvious that all of these measurements, they point into the vacuum ultraviolet range, like say around 150 nanometers, okay? so. Um, there's not a massive change. So 2007 uh, shifted essentially from the optical into the vacuum ultraviolet. Um, we, the, the latest measurements, they move this a little bit further into the ultraviolet, uh, vacuum ultraviolet, but it's not as dramatic shift um, as the one in 2007. And several measurements now quite consistently fall into the range around 150 nanometers. All right, uh, maybe that's a good moment to ask questions. No, still not. Julian, Julian raised a hand. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm curious uh, what kind of uh, laser sources are there already? I think 
not sure whether you said there were none or whether there were some. No, 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 there, there's not none. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so so the, the most promising um, effort or the most, yeah, let's, let's start differently. One of the ways to produce 150 nanometers is high harmonic generation. So um, you can create so-called odd harmonics. So the, the, the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic up to 31st or whatever um, from, from a laser using a high, strong field interaction with, um, with a gas jet or a plasma. And so one way to get to um, 250 would be to use the third harmonic of a laser that has 450 nanometers or the seventh harmonic of a laser that has 750 nanometers. So that uh, these are usually pulse lasers. Um, and we, in, in our lab, we are building a laser system, which is a femtosecond laser system to build a VUV frequency comb for direct spectroscopy. Uh, Eckhart is building a four wave mixing laser system um, to go to 150 nanometers. Um, so there are, there are a few approaches and the, the, the problem is that these lasers are very little tunable. So the better we know which wavelength we built this laser for, the, the more confidence we have. The confidence we have. So it's, it's very important to narrow down this energy range as far as possible before you, you invest really a lot of money into a build, a building a laser which is then three nanometers off. And then I think my follow-up question is also how much power do you really need to address the transition? It's a very good question, which is it's it's, it's not entirely clear. Um, uh, so the because we don't know the line width, we don't know the coupling strength exactly, and so um, it's it's not clear. But everything we have so far is not powerful enough. So we did experiments uh, at synchrotrons. Um, let's say these deliver at best 100 photons per hertz per second. Um, and these experiments were so far not successful that there's many reasons why they could not have been successful. Um, not only the, the weakness of the source, the spectral weakness, but we, we, need, we need a quite strong laser because it's not a dipole interacting two level system. It's a magnetic dipole, not an electric dipole. Really cool, thank you. Okay, good. So now I see that my time is actually up. So I'm not going to tell you, but I kind of anticipated that I'm not going to tell you about the two other experiments. I can just briefly tell you uh, what, what the main message is. So there's internal conversion experiments. Um, which measure the transfer of energy from the excited nucleus to the electron shell. And then there's an electron which is ejected. So it's called the internal conversion electron. And by measuring the energy of this electron, one can also measure or conclude the energy that has been stored before in the nucleus. And that gives a very similar result. This is this measurement here. And this measurement is actually using a synchrotron in Japan to excite to the second excited state. And then some sort of a lambda system you can actually pump into the, into the isomere. Um, and ironically, uh, now we've, we've, for decades, we've been searching for the energy of the first excited state of the thorium nucleus. Now the second excited state of the thorium nucleus is known to 0 0.07 electron volts. So it's one of the, the, the second excited state of the thorium nucleus is, is probably one of the best known nuclear levels um, as a byproduct of this, um, of this experiment. Right, okay. So, so I, I will jump directly to the summary and the outlook. I think we are quite certain that we will find the nuclear excitation energy um, around eight, 1.8.2 um, electron volts, and there are several groups now building dedicated laser systems for exactly um, trying to directly excite this. Um, so far, and that's very, very happy for me, this energy is still compatible with solid state approach because we can still find uh, VUV transparent solid state materials where we can embed these nuclei. 
Um, but the one, one big missing element so far is that what I claimed in the very beginning, that this is a nuclear system that can be manipulated by light or laser, this is still to be proven, okay? So we, we know the energy is maybe laser reachable, but nobody has excited, optically excited the atomic nucleus or the, the, the thorium nucleus, nor detected the radiative decay which would emit the BUV photon. And that's actually the challenge that we set out to do in a, in a new ERC synergy project, which involves uh, Eckhart Pike, Peter Tirov, and Mariana Safranova, which started in February of this year. Uh, these are these people. Um, and in case you found any of that interesting, don't hesitate to contact me because we are looking for PhDs and postdocs to actually build this clock that we keep speaking about. Thank you very much for your attention. These are credits to the people who contributed to the measurements that I showed you. And this is your last chance to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thorsten, for the, for the lecture and for giving us also uh, yeah, some of the really recent uh, developments on the, on the energy value of the sodium. Um, okay, you, you understand we are collaborating very closely, so I will not start asking questions, please. Um, the, the floor is open. Please uh, raise your hand or ask questions via the chat windows. Uh, may I ask a question? Please, Philippe. So uh, what I found really, really uh, interesting in this uh, experiment about thorium is the fact that for the first time, uh, maybe we will be able to have a, a a high accuracy measurement in uh, nuclear physics, a high accuracy in the term of uh, optical clock accuracy, so 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 19, or something like that. Do you think that uh, other than uh, realizing a possible uh, new kind of optical clock, this uh, experiment can lead to uh, a much deeper understanding of some aspect of uh, nuclear physics or, uh, or not? I'm skeptical, honestly, because the gap between, so it's usually if you do a quantitative measurement that helps you if you can compare it to a theory, right? And you can check whether theory A or theory B um, is better and so on. Currently, nuclear theory is so far from predicting even the order of magnitude we're speaking about here um, that at least this experiment will not be able to distinguish between various theoretical approaches. So I, I'm afraid that for, for, for over some time, it will be like a phenomenological number um, that I don't know how much we can learn about, about the nucleus. But there's, um, I mean, there, there are other properties of this nucleus, um, which we also investigate. So, this, so, so one thing that from an atomic physics perspective, I always find very cool is that the excited nuclear state actually has a completely different magnetic properties. Okay, so that means um, it, it's a different magnetic dipole, it's a different magnetic quadrupole, and so it couples to the electron shell, and it shifts the electron shell differently, whether it's in the ground state or in the, in the isomer state. And, and these are nuclear properties that we can learn about from, from various of these techniques. Okay, so we, we, we learn more about the nucleus, but it's not, we don't get it deep. I think by deeper understanding, you mean like uh, shape oscillation and, and open questions in nuclear physics. And I don't know how, how well this can connect. Thank you. There is a question here from Beth Fang, please. Hey, Beth, nice to hear from you. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Super. Hi, Torsten. Great talk. Hey. Uh, question if i follow you well so so now that the existence of existence of the isomer state is proven uh what makes you think that one day we will succeed in um optically exciting the state i mean uh, given that the technological difficulty in building a laser a a around this wavelength is uh, significant um, do you think there, there's actually any gain in, in continuing that? 
Well, it's, it's hard for somebody who built his career partially on being successful in this field to uh, g give an, an unbiased answer. <laughs> no, but I mean, um, I, I, I showed you that in the last 12 months, um, we have made tremendous progress um, in, on, in this field. And yes, there are times when, when the progress is slower and when we are fighting technological um, difficulties. Um, but but I I mean if if we keep on working the way we did in the last years I'm I'm very optimistic. So it's, All right. Um, and it's brilliant people. There's another question here in the chat. I will read it. Um, it's embedding the thorium ions into a solid seems promising but does it introduce systematic shifts? How does that translate into the expected nuclear clock accuracy? Yeah, yeah, very good point. Obviously, um, you can do nasty things with a nucleus, but you, it, it will have an effect. And so what we do is we put uh, thorium into calcium fluoride, that is a quite simple cubic, um, cubic transparent crystal, looks like sugar. Um, and the, we, we believe we have a quite good understanding on what the thorium does, so it will replace the calcium. Um, there will be a charge compensation mechanism, so the crystal will react by adding two additional fluoride um, ions at some specific um, position, and this will lead to the occurrence of electric field gradients um, at the position of the nucleus, which will shift. Uh, there are various shifts, but there are there there will be depth, yeah, there will be shifts of the nuclear transition. Now there's shift and there's broadenings. So um, the shifts will lead to, um, let's say, a degradation of accuracy. Once, uh, unless we know exactly how to how to characterize and compensate them, and the broadenings will degrade the performance. The dominating uh, broadening mechanism is a magnetic coupling with the uncontrolled nuclear dipoles magnetic dipoles of the neighboring fluor ions in that case. So that means the, the fact that you have neighboring um, nuclei that have an essentially uncontrolled magnetic field direction um, leads to a shift and that broadens the transition to uh, about one kilohertz line. width. So that means from something that is subhertz, we go to kilohertz and that is obviously a a dramatic um, degradation. Um, we can partially compensate this in the solid state approach by just using many, 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 many oscillators. Um, but the, the, the nuclear clock will never have, will not be the ultimate performance clock. If you ever want, the, if you if you put the clock into focus, you shouldn't do you shouldn't do solid state. Solid state is good for the intermediate steps of spectroscopy because we have many nuclei. It's a, it's a simple, um, it's a simple, I actually have one on my desk so I can show it to you. I don't know if that works with a camera. So here's a box and in that box, you see a little bit of a transparent cylinder. This is a thorium doped crystal. It's, uh, it has a few cubic millimeter in volume and it's very easy to carry this around and put this into a variety of laser sources or into a synchrotron. So it has many practical advantages to have a, like a, a portable, I can just carry this around and give, or even send it by mail to Japan, for example. People are currently shooting at these crystals um, at the at the spring eight. Um, so that there's practical advantages to do it solid state, but if you want the ultimate clock performance, uh, you would go for an ion track. Mm -hmm. There are some more questions in the in the chat. Is there room for improvement in the microcalorimeter? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. Um, there is, um, and it's we, we we are now down to seven EV um, resolution. Um, but as I said, the at the moment the resolution is not so much the dominating problem. The dominating problem is uh, it's it's lack of statistic, and it's the the energy calibration. So. Um, I mean, this measurement already gets better by just measuring longer. Um, but I'm, I mean, yeah, we, we want we want to go to 15 valid digits on this energy, and by by pushing the microcalorimeter, we can maybe gain 
a factor of two or three in, in, in error. And we will do that. So we will bring down the error from currently it's 0.2 EV. We will bring it down to 0.1 or maybe 0.05 or something like that. But that's not going to bring us the, the, the boost we need to, to push this really into, into something that, that resembles the clock. Mm -hmm. Related question here, what is the stability requirement for the optical laser to interrogate the isomer transition? It's tremendous. <laughs> So yeah, there there are many open questions. So if you if you eval want to evaluate the performance of the solid state uh, of, of a solid state or any thorium nuclear clock, you have to make very weird or or vague or or um, you have to make a lot of speculations on the possible performance of of the laser system concerning its line width. Um, actually, it's not entirely clear what the line width of these um, high harmonic generated lasers will be. In, and then and then you need incredible uh, long-term stability because this, the interrogation cycle will be really very slow. I mean, the good thing is uh, it's a narrow line with transition, but that also means the coupling is very weak. So you need a long time to excite it and you need a long time to detect it unless you find ways to quench it or use double resonance uh, techniques. But still, it's, it's going to be a very slow process. So that means the the so-called short-term stability, in that case, it's actually not so short of the laser system has to be excellent. And so that, therefore it's really speculative about to say what the performance of the clock can be because we can only say a few things possibly about the oscillator and not about, yeah, not about the laser system. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see no more hands up at present, and we are approaching also the uh, the one hour, and we are approaching actually the end of the workshop. So I think I would like, like first to thank uh, uh, Thorsten for the uh, for the talk uh, and for the uh, answers he is, he is given here. Let's Pleasure. raise our hands virtually, and uh, so with this, I'd also like to. Uh, uh, yeah, to thank you for your for your attention. And finally, I would like to hand the word over to the organizing uh, committee to uh, to Filippo and to and to Rob for the final conclusion of the workshop. Or maybe before I do this, I should also express my gratitude uh, to them for organizing this uh, this event. Thank you very much, Eka, and thank you, Torsten, for a fantastic uh, talk today. Uh, and to all of our speakers, I think it was a very, very nice workshop covering a wide range of topics. Uh, and I very much enjoyed attending all of the talks. And I hope the participants enjoyed it as much as I did. And so I want to thank all of the participants, not only from today, but for the whole session for, for joining us. Uh, and I should say a quick word of thanks to the co-organizers, Stefan and, and Filippo, for the work that they've done in putting this workshop together. Um, I'll hand the word to Filippo right at the end to say the final words of, of thanks. But I would like to take the opportunity in particular to acknowledge the work behind the scenes of Merce La Torre, um, our events coordinator here at ICFO. Um, she is here listening in. Um, she is this ICFO logo on the screen. She's done a lot of work behind the scenes in putting Hi, together <laughs> everything that's been required to make this workshop work, um, communicating with all of the speakers, um, putting together the, all of the, the sessions, all of the information for the speakers, for the audience, and, and controlling everything behind the scenes. And as ever, she's done it fantastically well. So thank you very much, Merce, for all of your work. It's thank you, Rob. Much appreciated and made the workshop run very smoothly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rob. So I, I also would like to, to join uh, acknowledging uh, the work of Merce, first of all, that was really important and uh, was everything worked perfectly fine during these uh, four days. And for, for me, at least, it was the first time that uh, I was organizing an online workshop of this kind, uh, four days of uh, lectures, and I think uh, it was a quite a nice experience. And uh, I hope that uh, all uh, the students, and not only the students, because I have seen that uh, a lot of uh, older people attended this, uh, this section in these days, that you enjoyed as well as much as I did uh, all the talks that were really at a very, very high level. And um, so thank you, everyone. 
and for, thank you all for the people that joined for uh, having the patience to, to join for four days consecutively in the afternoon to stay with us uh, for this workshop. Fantastic. Thank you, Filippo. I think with that, uh, with those nice words, we should close the workshop. Thank you to everybody. Thank and you. We shall see you next time. And uh, as Merce will uh, post uh, all the recorded uh, lectures on YouTube, and then uh, on uh, we will uh, make a mirror to this uh, YouTube uh, links uh, on the website of uh, our institute and on the website of our projects. Okay. Perfect. I will thank send you. the links to you as soon as possible. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I'm going to finally end uh, the meeting and this uh, workshop. And I hope to see you uh, soon in the next one. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.